Hey everybody, hope you're having a great spring break. Um, I know it's been a while since uh, we had a walk and then the icy roads and uh, now you guys are off this week. So uh, in order to catch us up, uh, I'm gonna create this video to cover chapter 11. That way we can shift some things around and stay on track for your departmental exam. Um, so pretend right now that I look like the picture on the top and that I'm not actually at home in my pajamas and it's raining outside. So if you can hear some noise in the background too, um, the little brown dog on the bottom has curled up next to me and might start to snore at some point. So if you hear something loud, just ignore it because this is coming to you from my home in Ennis, Texas. So anyways, let's uh, take a look at how we're going to shift our schedule. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to go over chapter 11. We're going to talk about public relations. We're going to talk about uh, integrated communications, pitches, backgrounders, fact sheets, that sort of thing. So this is really where um, in the everyday world I spend most of my time since I work in public relations. So hopefully I can give you guys some real life examples and um, I'm also going to provide some examples of these things on uh, Blackboard. So be sure to get on Blackboard, look at the examples, look at the updated course schedule and uh, because you're going to have some stuff to do when we come back for the midterm. So Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first thing is, uh, you guys are enjoying this week off, nice spring break, uh, watching this video, and then you're going to be working on a couple of things to turn in on March 18th. So um, when I see you on March 18th, you're going to be taking your midterm. You'll come to class at 545 on time. Uh, if you have any extra credit you haven't turned in, uh, if you need to turn in, uh, I'm also going to be looking at your media logs while you're taking your midterm, so bring those with you. Um, your third team briefing is due. Um, and make sure that you have read and watched uh, this video over chapter 11. That's an easy thing to do. So uh, once we've done that, um, you don't have to turn in your news release, your backgrounder, and your pitch letter, uh, which will those assignments will come from this video, but you will be turning them in March 25th. So if you have any questions when I see you on the 18th, that will be your chance to ask about them, okay? Um, and so you're going to pick kind of one company or organization to write all, all three of those assignments about. Um, so be prepared for that. Okay, uh, and your team meet third media briefing, you guys should be pretty, you know, up to date on that with who's writing it and how that works. Um, and I'm going to try to, uh, over my spring break, which is the week of March 18th, actually post all of your grades and things online in Blackboard so you can take a look at those. So with that happening, we won't have um, the lecture over Chapter 11 because this video is it. So that way on March 25th, we will be caught back up. So We'll be then on March 25th, we'll be going over chapter 7 and 10. You're going to turn in your pitch letter, news release, and backgrounder. And then, um, again, be sure to check Blackboard for that new course schedule. So that's the plan right now. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I know some of you have had trouble emailing your videos. Um, and with all the weather delay, that's okay. I will accept your videos until March 18th. You must bring them in when you take your midterm. Because if you can't get them emailed, bring them in on a flash drive, okay? So I will allow them up until March 18th for your videos. I believe that was exercise eight. Um, I did notice when we talked about the course schedule that exercise nine was another, was an older one from when I previously taught this course. It was a video script and you guys have pretty much, you've done that with exercise eight. So we're actually gonna be replacing that with an AP style um, assessment later later in um, at the end of this month. So just to, don't worry about exercise nine. We'll, we'll figure that out later. Okay, so we are going to um, talk a little bit about, I've been grading your feature stories and your news stories, so there were a couple of things that I wanted to point out that I noticed uh, that a couple of you guys struggled with, and the reason I want to point this out is because you're going to be writing for your departmental exam, so these are things you need to remember. Um, drill them in your brain because you need to have them uh, for that exam on, in April. So. Um, you need three sources in your writing. Now, with the departmental exam, you're going to be there's going to be a person in there that you're going to be interviewing. So I'm not sure if they're going to require that or not. I will talk with them. I have a feeling they are. Um, you need to uh, and name sources can be other people who are quoting. It could be you know New York Times. It could be a reference material. Remember, sources can be more than just an actual person. Um, break up into small paragraphs. Some of you are still writing these big long paragraphs. Most of your the time, your paragraphs shouldn't be more than two to three sentences. And sometimes that may just be a sentence apiece. Smaller paragraphs are better. Make sure when you're referring to someone on attribution that it's their first and last name. So if you're writing a story about me, it would be Kristen Zastapol the first time. 
And then every other time you refer to me in the story, it's just Zastapol. Um, the only exception to that would be if you're writing about a family and they all have the same last name. So then you would you would use their first names to identify them. But nine times out of ten, it's first and last name and then last name everywhere else. Um, the punctuation goes inside the quotes. Okay, and so I have an example there for you. Always that that comma after quotes goes inside the quotes. Um, and then the last bulleted item there, always use said. A lot of you like to put says, S-A-Y-S, or replied, or stated. Um, I know it sounds plain, but again, we're going for the 10 cent word, not the $10 million word. So the person always said, and you don't put attribution at the beginning of the story unless you're writing about, you're writing in broadcast writing. So for these feature stories, for your press releases, for your news stories, you're always gonna start the quote and if it's really long, you might put in the middle, you know, Zastapol said, period, and then open the quote back up. Um, or you can put it at the very end, but you really, you don't put it before the quote. So keep those in mind as you're writing from here on out, especially as we're getting into this next step of writing press releases. So um, one thing I do want to uh, share with you guys that I came across this week, if you haven't seen it, it's a really great video. Uh, I'm going to try to play it here and hopefully it'll pick up the audio. Um, as we've talked a lot about bias this semester, uh, especially in writing, um, this video came up last week uh, talking about Love Has No Labels. And um, it's a really great video uh, that I want you guys to take a look at. and best friends. We all have different religions, but we have universal love as well. <laughs> I love my sister. Love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. All right. 
right. So, I uh, hope you guys like that. You know, get out of tissue. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it's just a great example of bias and how when you take away, you know, some of those filters as far as age and gender and race and things that we look at, it, it makes you look at things differently, I'm sure. So, all right, let's dive into um, chapter 11. So, uh, this chapter really focuses on writing for public relations. Um, you know, no matter the organization or business, business function or purpose, um, you have to pay attention to its communication at every level. Um, and so, with that, you know, public, public relations is really managing those different communication methods to different publics. You know, there's internal public relations dealing with employees. There's external relations. We're going to talk about some integrated communications. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really dealing with all those different communities, all those different publics to make it very simple. So um, if you look in your book on page 227, uh, the opening paragraph really describes well what it is. So we're going to take a look and to have a little bit of fun, you know, my context as far as being um, having worked in public relations for the last, goodness, let me think now, 12 years, um, has really been in school public relations. And as you guys know, there's all different kinds. There's, um, you know, uh, hospital or, you know, I should say health, excuse me, health public relations, there's um, corporate PR, there's nonprofit PR, there's, um, you know, if you look at oil and gas industry, there's a lot of technical uh, types of public relations working for different business and industries. So, um, you know, my context and a lot of the examples I'm going to give you are within the context of school public relations, but they can really cross over into other areas. And so, I know most of you are not, like I say, journalism or PR uh, majors, uh, but wherever you go to work at, uh, whatever industry, whatever field, whatever your job is, you're going to have to communicate on a daily basis. Um, so you are a, a big integral part of internal PR uh, wherever you work, even though you're not the PR person. Um, and depending on your role in the company, you know, you may be asked to make pitches or present information or deal with the public, deal with clients. So whether you're the PR person or not, hopefully some of these things can help you uh, as you start to talk and communicate about your company and what it is that your company does. Because once you're hired somewhere, everybody's got to tote the company line, right? You've all got to make the company look good and uh, let them know that you are, you know, an advocate for it 24-7. It never stops, right? So, uh, while I was gone at the end of February, I told you guys I went to the school PR conference. Uh, we had a little fun there and uh, created a video that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, you know, even though this is recording and you're watching at home, you're going to get cool videos from me. So, that, that's kind of my thing. So, I would like for you guys to enjoy the birth of school public relations. Névvalók több disznót, amen kül sem ő. Igazolom, magának nem is érdemes. A balog Berci, az igen, annak érdemes. Ki az a balog Berci? Hogy nekünk nem érdemes, neki meg igen. Senki se nevel szebb disznókat a faluban, mint az én uram. A tizlani, mint a balog Berci. Miért? Azt mondja meg miért? Ezért mi? Mert a balog Berci kilógrap, mert mindent kapott a húsjertéseiért. Mondtam én azt, hogy csak a Balogh Bercinek érdemes disznót hízol. Ah, nem csak Balogh Bercinek. Én Zsindely András vagyok, a Vörös Fajnál TSZ elnöke. Mi 17 forint 50 fillért kapunk kilónként a falkásított sertéseink után. Mert 50 darabon felül a feltételek szerint átadott sertések után két forint kilónként a nagyüzemi felát. Tehát milyen ember ez a Balogh Berci? Milyen TSZ ez a Vörös Fajnál? Hogy milyen? Hát okos. Mind a kettő okos, mert szerződés kötöttek az állatforgalmi vállalattal. Értik már? Hát ezért érdemes disznót izgalni. Gyere vele mi busztal, bevideszünk támasztal, köteleg a nyár. A jól előkészített IBUSZ társas utazáson nyelvtudás nélkül kevesebb pénzért többet lát. az igazgató a Martin brigáddal. Ha sikerülne a műhely selejtett 9-ről 6%-ra csökkenteni, az több mint 2 millió forint megtakarítást jelentene. 
A brigád szakmai továbbképzésén néhány hétig a selejt csökkentés témája kerül előtérbe. Aztán egy márciusi délután a gyári klubban összekoccannak a poharak. Nem csak az új eredményeket ünneplik, hanem elsősorban a brigád vezetői elnöki tanácsa a szocialista munkahősek kitüntetést adományozta. Öt napja vagyunk már úton. Nem szégyeljük ezt a képet. Ez a stopp, az erdélyi fenség erdőrengetegében úgynevezett műszaki megállás az utasok érdekében. Ennél finomabban nem tudom mondani. Persze jól jönnek ezek a percek. Hétfőn reggel ettem kocsonyát, délre káposztát, estére káposztát. Kedden... Lapos csizmát visel a babám, a bíz zenére bokázikám. Húz rá gitár, hey, szakadjon a, szakadjon a húr, húr, húr. Húz rá gitár, így mulat egy vites magyar úr, úr. So uh, anyways, we hope you uh, enjoy that. Um, <laughs> that was a friend of mine from Allen ISD actually made that for our big awards dinner. He puts a lot of humor into it. And so if you're looking for that video to take it and put your own subtitles to it, it's an old Hungarian propaganda video. So having some fun with it there. Okay, so looking at public relations, we're going to focus on what public relations is, first of all. Um, successful PR really builds and maintains good relationships between an organization and its public. So that, that's the big thing about school PR. Everything from announcing a new product, uh, which is more sales, to showing how a company is, has gone green or is concerned to, about its you know, citizens, its community, uh, to public service announcements. Those are all public relations. Um, some think public relations is free publicity, but real public relations is expensive. Um, it, it takes a lot to maintain ongoing programs to communicate with different publics and audiences. Um, as we've gone more digital and gotten away from, you know, in the last you know 15 to 20 years and gotten away from all of the paper printed newsletters, and now we're able to email and send push notices to phones, and we have social media, uh, it's getting a little more affordable. Um, and so smaller businesses are able to take on uh, more PR efforts than they used to be able to. Um, but, you know, it's public relations. You know, my father was a, owned a lumber company, and he was probably the best salesman I know. Um, and people used to say, oh, you're going to be just like him. And I thought, I don't want to have to sell a product. I can't stand selling a product. I don't want to worry about sales and commissions. Um, I want to go into public relations, which there is a connection there, yes. But in PR, you're really dealing with the whole image of a company. Um, is selling a product part of it? Absolutely. But you're, you're looking at the bigger picture of, you know, how do people feel about my organization? Um, does it have a good reputation? Is it something that's going to be lasting? Is it something that because of our good reputation, we can sell these products? So it, it's really different than a sales position, um, although they are related. Um, and so do I have to, you know, sell an idea or a product? Absolutely. Um, you know, it used to be a pretty negative way to, uh, to address public relations people. We would call them spin doctors. Um, and the idea behind public relations is that it's, you aren't spinning things. You aren't spinning the truth. You aren't telling lies. Everything is still factual. You're just presenting it in the best way possible for your company. Um, you know, we don't lie. We don't leave out things. It's not omission and, you know, you don't omit stuff, um, but you're trying to focus with that inverted pyramid on the very positive things at the beginning. Um, you know, we gave the example and talked about earlier in the semester where I had a school that uh, somebody caught the middle school bathroom on fire. It was a kid and it was pretty minimal. No damage was really done. And we had a cafeteria lady who rushed in and put it out and got the kids out. And so when I wrote that press release, do we lie about the fire? Or, no, absolutely not. We talk about it. But the whole focus of the story was the fact that we had this great dedicated employee who went in and took care of business. And, you know, further down in that inverted pyramid at the bottom of that story, we talked about how, you know, the student has been identified and we are, you know, working with them to discipline them in the appropriate manner. So, you know, we, we don't leave out the negative stuff. It's there, but we really try to focus on the positive. That's the difference. 
So, um, there are all kinds of public relations tools and they're growing every day with social media and video and things going viral. And so these are just, you know, some examples, but there's a, there are a lot of others out there. Um, but the bottom line is, is the best PR tool is face-to-face -face contact. Um, it always boils down to that because um, it's about building trust and reputation with, with, with your community, with your publics. And so you probably heard that. That was my dog snoring. Um, and so really face-to-face -face, uh, connection is the best way you can go. Um, I do work in school PR, but I also, you know, manage a nonprofit for the Education Foundation for our school, which does a lot of fundraising. Uh, and that's fundraising, a huge part of fundraising is PR and developing your, your brand and making sure the community knows that you're reputable because they've got to trust you to be able to give money to you. That's a huge thing. So definitely face-to-face -face and relationship buildings are really important when it comes to nonprofit PR and developing those, those fundraising. So um, you guys are familiar with news releases. They're also called press releases releases. Uh, you guys are going to be writing one. You're going to pick a company or organization of your choice to write one about. Um, and you're going to write it just like you do a news story because the bottom line is, is you want them to take a press release that is written in inverted pyramid, has perfect AP style, and you want to send it to a news outlet and them go, wow, this is a great story. We're going to plug it in because then they're plugging in exactly what you want them to. Um, but if it's not an AP style and it's not an inverted pyramid and they have to spend time and money and resources, their people, to rewrite it, there's a less likely chance they're going to run with that because it takes more effort on their part. So you want to write it, you know, as close to a new story as possible, but you get to put your, your touch on it. You get to focus on the positive thing for your organization. Feature release is kind of the same way. They're just like feature stories, but... Um, you know, a lot of times you might target these to a specific organization. So, for instance, um, I got to write an article for the Texas Association of School Boards. It's TASA and Texas Association of School Administrators, TASA, and we write a communications piece. So, I know that in that audience, it's not going to be my school PR people. My audience is actually school administrators, superintendents, business office managers, things like that. So, writing tips that are pra more practical for them is really where my, my focus was. Uh, media kits, uh, these usually have fact sheets, backgrounders, fo um, photographs, biographies, anything about a company organization in it. Sometimes it's for a special event to really get some information across. Um, you also have direct mail letters, usually specific for a specific project or event. Um, those aren't used quite as much anymore because they're really costly and the return on them is pretty minimal. Um, of course, brochures. We're going to be talking about brochures at the end of the semester. You're going to design a simple brochure yourself. Uh, websites. You also have uh, speeches, public forums, meetings, conventions, all kinds of stuff. Audiovisual presentations uh, to go with speeches. Specialized publications. Uh, public service announcements. Um, those some are some are radio format. Some are video format. Uh, you also have blogs um, and what we call image advertising, which is going to change your perception of an organization or company. Um, and those are usually done within uh, conjunction with a marketing department. So, okay, so let's look at media lists and media kits. So, because you're going to be developing a pitch letter, and a pitch letter usually goes out to you identify which media you're going to send it to. So, usually, you usually have a list of reporters, if it's an editor, producer, depends on if you're sending to news, radio, television. Um, and you're going to be getting their inf contact information. Maybe it's their email. Uh, if you're going to email that over or send over video, and if they have a certain deadline. For example, if I'm working with a newspaper and their newspaper goes to print at 4 o'clock in the afternoon for the next morning edition, I don't want to send them over something at 3.30. I want to give them some time to look it over. So knowing those deadlines can be really helpful. Um, magazines are one that you really need to learn the deadlines about because, you know, some of them plan their editorial blocks 12 months in advance. So it might be something that if you're working on a big event, um, you know, we have a big gala in October. So if I'm going to send it over to the magazine and ask them to do a full feature piece on it, I might have to get on it as soon as January of this year to be able to get it in for October's edition. So that's something to think about. Um, they, uh, practitioners, PR practitioners like to keep a list of media logs, who they are, when they contacted them, kind of the stories and questions they get. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about media kits, which includes things like fact sheets and backgrounders, news releases, a lot of information. It really is just a, you know, maybe it's your main brochure for your company. It's a calendar of events for your company. 
Um, you know, these are really key, crucial, big, big contain. They contain big things as far as public relations goes. And so if you're really trying to get some overarching coverage, maybe throughout a year long process or something, you might send over a whole kit. So you're really going to be focusing on a media list, a pitch letter, um, and a fact sheet and backgrounder as well. So, okay. So the next thing we're going to look at, uh, we talked about press releases. Um, we talked about, uh, media advisories. Um, we're going to talk a little further about fact sheets and backgrounders uh, on in this video, but um, these are really one-page sheets with information about an organization, service product, uh, product, special activity, what's going on. Usually on one side you have the fact sheet, which is, uh, it might have your company heading at the top, and it really bullets um, important facts about your company or organization. If it's a fact sheet on a specific product, then it would be just about that specific product or an event. Um, backgrounders are really kind of the history of the organization or the product, um, and they really should go with any press release you send out to give some accompanying information to someone who may not be familiar about your organization. So, all right, so we already talked a little bit about um, brochures, newsletters, PSAs. Um, everything goes online this day, in this day and age. I don't design a brochure. I don't write a news release. I don't come up with a fact sheet or back backgrounder that doesn't go online. So, all of these things that used to be just printed materials are print and also online now. Um, so keep that in mind when you're uh, when you're writing. Okay, so we look at public relations writing. We're really looking at, at at four things. You have to research. Okay, knowing your audience is a really big part of researching, uh, whether it's formal or informal. Uh, planning. Uh, getting everything prepared for your campaign. Your communication is really your PR campaign. Uh, it's how you get, disseminate that information. And then the evaluation. Was it effective? You can't just put all this information out there and think, okay, we did our job. We promoted the product. Well, did you? Did it work? Did you reach your target audiences? Are they doing what you expect them to do? Um, we looked at a, a little diagram earlier in the semester that, you know, had three bubbles. And it talked about, you know, you have to inform people, you have to, during this communication process, you have to inform them about your company, your product, your organization, in order to change their attitude. That was the second step. And once people had an attitude change and they like your company or your product or your organization, then they're going to go ahead and change their behavior. That's the, that's the third part about it. So inform, attitude, behavior. Those are kind of the, the, the steps in that communication piece that really get them to then when you get to your evaluation, you can say, did we change their, did we tell them what we needed to tell them? Did we change their attitude? Were we able to change their behavior? Did they, you know, like our company on Facebook? Did they come buy a product from us? You know, that's what you really have to look at. So, okay. So, um, we're going to keep going here and okay. The public relations process. So again, back to the research, the first step. Um, you have to find out everything you can about um, the different audiences that you're going to be looking at. So when I'm working in school PR, obviously parents are an audience for us. Students, because we have high school students who, you know, we're, we're communicating with as well a lot of times about something going on in our district. Um, and not just parents, but we have grandparents raising kids. We have foster parents. We have aunts and uncles raising kids. Um, our staff. I work in a rural community where... Um, you know, the town I work in is the county seat, and we are the largest employer in the county. So our staff, uh, we need to make sure that they know what's going on because they're our biggest advocates for us. We employ, you know, about 700 people there. Um, and so, you know, looking at all those different audiences, and sometimes it may be something very specific. It may be parents of just graduating seniors or parents of kindergarten students. So um, finding out everything we can about them is really important. Uh, then we can look how other organizations have dealt with it. Um, because I'm a member of the Texas School Public Relations Association, where I was just at, at the end of February, um, that's a lot of what that conference is about, is sharing what other districts are doing and what works for them. So we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Now, depending on what type of PR you're in, you may not always get cooperation from your competitors. Um, school PR, nonprofit PR, those are arenas that we share because we have our own targeted audiences. We operate kind of in our own bubbles. Um, but certainly you can look at other organizations who may not be in your bubble. Um, maybe they're in a little bit area, different area demographically. You just have to take those demographics into, into consideration. Um, and so looking at who must be served. Um, and that demographics does play a key role in that. You know, I work in a district that 
is 76% economically disadvantaged. You know, most of our parents don't have a computer at home. Um, so it wasn't until recently with everyone getting a smartphone <laughs> that we could um, kind of back off of so much printed material. We were one of the school districts that was kind of slow, uh, slow to the game when it came to moving everything digitally, upgrading websites. Um, when I came back to work for them about three years ago was when we really got them on board with social media because before then, you know, parents were still getting printed newsletters at home because they don't have computers, internet access at home. What we found now, though, is everybody has a smartphone. So, you know, now we have a website that is what we call dynamic or responsive. It adjusts so you can see it differently on your phone versus your iPad versus a computer. And um, we are very involved with social media, Facebook, Twitter, all those different things. And when we talk about social media in the coming weeks, we'll talk about social media demographics in general. For example, uh, you guys are probably all on Twitter and Instagram versus me, who is the, you know, 25 to 40 year old who are parents, you know, they're all into Facebook now because I joined Facebook when I was your age in college. And so I'm still on there. So we know at the school, if I actually want to communicate to my parents, I'm actually going to have a, a better time doing it through Facebook. If I want to communicate to my young alumni, going through Twitter and Instagram is probably a better choice. So we'll talk about all that when we get to social media. It's kind of fascinating. So, again, we've talked about the research. Now we're going to look at the next three phases. Planning, okay, uh, it's going to help you decide which publics you have to communicate with. Um, so, for example, if you pick an organization to write your press release about, okay, say you pick a fraternity or a service organization there at Baylor that you're a part of, okay, who are you trying to target? Are you trying to recruit people for your organization? Are you trying to let the community know what you do because maybe you want donations or you want help with the service project? Um, are you trying to let other students know what you're doing? What is your target audience? And so determining your audience, then you can decide um, once you've selected your public. So maybe you've got a community service project and you want the community in general, all of Waco and Baylor, to pitch in and help with that. Those are your publics. So then you've got to determine, okay, how can we contact these people? How can we best get this message across to them? And this is really that planning phase where you sit down and you roll up your sleeves and you kind of start looking at what you need to do. It's a communication planner strategy. So you're going to be looking at which communication tools you're going to use. Are you going to use social media? Are you going to use uh, news releases? You're going to use a local paper. You're going to use the school newspaper. Are you going to use... Um, you know, friends, are you going to create a social media war room and, you know, have all of the people from the organization there and share with their friends? Um, you're also going to set your deadlines. So knowing when the magazine deadlines are and the newspaper deadlines and the radio station, that really is helpful. So then once you've set all of these goals and strategies and you got this plan in place, the communication piece is actually going out and doing it. It's carrying out the plan. So you write down your information, you distribute that out, uh, whether it's video, radio, newspaper, that's the communication is the actual do part. You go out and you do, okay? Um, and then you go to the evaluation piece. So you have to make sure that your plans are effective, um, that you are reaching the audiences that you're supposed to, because if you don't, what's going to happen is, okay, back to the example that you're an organization who's created a service project and you want the community to help. No one's going to show up to help you. <laughs> no one's going to show up and pitch in. Um, if you decide that you want, you know, young, strong muscle work to come, you know, repaint the house for Habitat for Humanity as part of your service organization's project, um, you're probably not going to advertise in just the newspaper because that reaches a, an older generation. You're probably going to look at social media because that's a younger generation. That's the muscles you're going to need to come paint the house, you know, maybe the school newspaper. Um, and so, you know, you're going to have to go and evaluate if it's effective or not. If you had people who were informed, who changed their attitude, who then changed their behavior. So, um, when it comes to the public relations practitioner, um, they're going to handle internal and external publics. Uh, depending on the size of the company, that might be different people. Um, I have friends at Dallas ISD. One of them, her job is to only handle external PR. That's all she does, uh, community relations. I have another one who works for Dallas ISD that all she does is internal. All she does is work with their staff. Uh, because you can imagine if you work for Dallas ISD and you have a disgruntled employee, they're going to go out and be 10 times louder than someone who's happy. I mean, think about when you're, uh, when you buy a product or, you know, go pay for a service somewhere and someone makes you mad because they blow you off or the service is done poorly. 
Well, you start telling everybody you know, oh my gosh, that was horrible. I had to wait in line forever, and then they overcharged me, and they didn't do what I needed to. But if you have a good experience, it's like, oh, okay, that's, we've kind of taken it for granted. It's a great experience. Let's move on. And you don't really tell people about it. So, um, you know, internal PR is a really big part of making sure that all of the external PR runs smoothly as well. Um, the work of the PR practitioner, they're going to counsel other people on the best practices. Um, everybody thinks that they can do public relations because they can communicate and they talk and I know what people like and that's not the case. As you can see going through this and studying that, you know, good PR is a, a process and you have to learn about PR theories and you have to really learn how to research and know your audiences. So um, the role of the PR practitioner is to give the best advice that they can to management. Um, I work in a department with uh, three other people and so we all have different strengths and weaknesses and our role is to give the best advice possible when it comes to the communications of our school district to our superintendent, to what we call our cabinet, our principals, uh, to let them know, you know, the best ways to communicate. We work with news media, we help produce uh, functions and events. So yes, event planning is part of my job, but it is not my job 24-7, uh, although that is the fun side of it. I know some of you want to be event planners. Okay, so characteristics of PR practitioners. Um, you gather information, you have to be willing to write, and you have to be willing to take criticism for it. Um, and realize, you know, um, I do some writing, I do a lot more graphic design, and I always tell people, it's like if I send a flyer over to a teacher who needs it for something, or a, a press release, and say, hey, does this work, you know, this is information about your student, they're always kind of hesitant to tell me anything bad. And I have to tell them, it's okay. <laughs> you know, this is not, it's just, it's a, sometimes it's a matter of opinion because, you know, I like blue, you like green. That doesn't, if you tell me you don't like blue, it's not going to hurt my feelings. You know, um, it's, it's kind of a, you know, you've got to be able to take it and roll with it and be able to change it around. Um, you know, everything that I create is subject to my supervisor and the superintendent's approval. So, you know, you have to be ready for that. Um, you really have to know your company inside and out. Um, knowing that, uh, knowing your public as well for very specific communication, um, you know, you have to be willing to toke the company line. Sometimes I don't always agree with the decisions that are made, but once a decision is made as the PR practitioner, I have to support it and, um, communicate that to the public. And, you know, if there's any dissenters, I'm laughing at that school PR video, but, you know, any dissenters will be shot, you know. That's not the case, but if I am put out this message that everything's great with this, this is a wonderful thing for the district, and then people who know me see me bashing it somewhere else, then they're not going to buy into it. So um, as a PR practitioner, being good with people is a part of it, being able to persuade. The biggest thing I think more than persuasion is being able to read people. Um, just like when I'm sitting in the classroom lecturing to you guys, I'm actually reading your faces. And so it's really hard for me to sit here and record this and, and not know if you guys are falling asleep or how you're responding to it. Um, I can't pull out my silly string and ding you. Um, so it, it's one of those things that that's the biggest part of my job is being able to read people. You know, how are they reacting to this? Is this something that you know, we need to kind of change our tone. We need to change our message a little bit. Am I picking the right words? Um, that's something we have to be aware of. Okay, so the role of good writing. Um, public relations practitioners have to be good writers at their core. Um, they have to adopt different styles and tone because you have multiple audiences that you have to reach in multiple media outlets. So it's still ground, grounded in good journalistic writing, you know, AP style, inverted pyramid. It's still... All of these things, again, I'm the squeaky, you know, record that's set on repeat telling you clear, concise, accurate, all of those things. So um, good writing is still good writing, um, whether you're a news reporter or a public relations practitioner. Um, so, okay, so we're going to look at writing news releases. There's quite a few tips on these next few slides about writing news releases. Um, these are things that an organization wants to make public, written in the form of a news story, which means inverted pyramid, AP style. Um most news releases end up in what we call the round bin, okay, the trash, <laughs> because they're poorly written. They didn't use inverted pyramid. They're AP styles all over the place, and the people who get them don't understand it. They don't get the news value, so um, you've really got to focus on something important. Um, my school district is 45 minutes southeast of Dallas, so there are so many school districts in the DFW area that the chances of us getting picked up on the Dallas 
TV news is very rare unless we have something really, really cool taking place. Um, for us, uh, not this year, but the year before last, we had an alum who was in the Super Bowl, Louis Vasquez with the Denver Broncos. And so, um, you know, we all, we had Louis Vasquez day and we had this big pep rally and he sent a thing, a, a news release. And for DFW, that was pretty big because they didn't have any other body locally. We were the closest locally with it. So we actually made the Dallas news, which is great. Um, we don't want them showing up on our doorstep every time we have something negative. Um, but that's usually when they come. So we certainly want to continue to pitch things to them that are positive and hopefully they pick them up. Okay. So, um, always put a headline in cause you want the chance to write your own headline and it should contain information about how you can be contacted. Um, I have some sample press releases on blackboard. Uh, they have mine and my supervisor's names on them. Um, and so we have our cell phones with them. So it's one of those things that if it's eight o'clock and they're getting ready to pick it up and run it with the 10 o'clock news, it doesn't matter that I'm having dinner with my family. If I get a phone call, I have to answer it and answer those questions about it. So that's a part of it. Okay. A couple of tips for news release. Is it newsworthy? Is it something that is really going to grab people's attention? Okay. We don't want the jet skiing squirrel. We've talked about the jet skiing squirrel on a slow news night. Okay. Start strong, right for the media. Um, on occasion, media outlets online will pick up the press release and run it with little or no modification. But most of the time, journalists are going to use it kind of as a springboard to um, write their larger story or, or dig even more because they do want to do their due diligence. Not everything is news. Just because you're excited about it doesn't mean that everybody else is. Um, you know, is it interesting? Um, you know, avoid cliches such as customer saves money and great customer service. Bottom line, why, why should I care? Why should anyone care about it? Um, you know, does your press release paint a really good picture um, of how your company or organization solved a problem, um, how your service or product fulfills the needs, um, what are the benefits? Um, if you're reporting on a big corporate milestone, you know, you need to attribute your success or failure to the events. You know, is there significant growth in your company? What did you do right? Show cause and effects. Everything has to be factual, okay? We, we don't want to pull a Brian Williams here. <laughs> so, um, you know, avoid embellishments and exaggerations. If it's true, um, you may want to tone it down a little bit because you don't want to, some of the stories that are too good to be true, you don't want to hurt your own credibility. Okay, pick an angle, okay? Something that will catch people's attention. Um, active voice, we always talk about active voice. Um, looking at the economics of words, um, Use enough words to tell your story, but don't use a bunch of unnecessary adjectives and flowery language. Remember, 10 cent word, not $10 word, okay? Um, wordiness really distracts from your story, so keep it concise and every word should count, and don't repeat yourself. Uh, beware of jargon. Uh, I work as a school district. We have education ease. There's an acronym for everything, and you have to be very careful of that because not everybody knows what that is. Um, and really looking at your AP style book on some of those things that we can say FBI on first reference, but we can't necessarily say, you know, uh, the national, you know, can we say NAACP on a first reference? Yes. Can we, you know, some of those you can, some of them you can't. Um, so what's kind of universally accepted and what's not. Um, stay away from the exclamation point because it kind of leads to editorializing. And if you've, you you had these in your news and feature stories, it's your enemy. Just don't use it. It's a period or a question mark because you can have questions in there, but that's it. Um, and make sure that you have permission. Um, if you're going to include quotes from your employees, if I'm, I wrote a, a story last week about a student who had tried out for an international drum corps and he made it from our high school. And um, I asked his band, our band directors to give us some quotes about him. So I said, hey, we're going to use this in the news release, so I need your permission. You know, please give me some quotes. Um, don't just make up things. Um, now, for the education foundation I work for, um, you know, I'm on a speed dial basis with my uh, board president. And so if I'm writing a news release about something, uh, do I make up quotes for him? Absolutely. But before I ever send anything out, I actually send over the quote and go, hey, I'm writing a news release. Here's the topic. You know, here's the quote I came up with. Would you say this? Does it sound good? Do I have permission to give, you know, to attribute your name to this? And absolutely, he'll say yes. So, you know, you can do that if there's a specific quote that you're looking for as a public relations practitioner, but I still have to get permission to use it, okay? So, now we're going to look at formatting. Do not use all capital letters, AP style, grammar, punctuation, spelling, 
have to have more than one paragraph. Break it into small paragraphs. Um, don't put your email contact information in the body of the release because they will print it in the newspaper. <laughs> okay, so you'll notice on the samples that I give you, they're up in the up in the right hand corner, and so um, that is for the um, for the uh, newspaper or whoever else to get in touch with you, but you don't want it out there for the world. Okay, um, use letterhead, double space. A lot of times you'll see people in with the dash 30 zero or end or um, the, I say pound, you guys probably say hashtag. Hashtag symbol is another new way to end too where we'll put four or five hashtags at the end and that way they know it's the end of your press release. Okay, video news releases are becoming a little more common, especially in the digital age and a lot of them are just putting them on YouTube themselves and whether the media picks them up or not, oh well. Um, so they're also called VNRs. Basically, it's a it's a video version of your press release. That that's all that it is. Um, you know, they used to be expensive to produce. Uh, thus, our book talks about that. Um, their effectiveness sometimes is questionable. However, if you are making this and putting it on your own YouTube channel, uh, and you can make it very inexpensively, why not? Because we are such a visual uh, visual generation, visual uh, community. So keep that in mind. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to point out, I want to go back and just so I can and share with you, there is a sample press release in your book on page 234. Okay, you'll see that. Um, there's also some more information about video news releases on page 236, 237. We're not going to get into that very much. Um, and then you'll also see your parts of a, of a letter on page 238. We're going to talk about your pitch letter here in just a second. Okay, so for your backgrounder, um, the link there will help you. You should take a look at it. Um, it kind of describes what backgrounders are and gives some examples. Um, backgrounder, it's an information sheet, and you send it with your press releases, everything else. So bottom line is, is if I didn't know anything about your company or organization, and you write a press release about this great new product that you've put out, okay, great, but who are you? <laughs> um, you know, when we write an inverted pyramid style, we're really focusing on the main thing. It's the product and how great it is. I don't need a history lesson inside of that. But as a reporter, if I want to be familiar with it and maybe add a little bit of my own, I need a backgrounder sheet to give me some, some information on your company or organization. Um, they're always short. They're written in AP style. They're no longer than a page. Um, they, they basically, they fill people and they fill in the blanks about your company or organization. So, okay. Usually when I do these, the backgrounder goes on the front page and the fact sheet goes on the back page, okay? They're all kind of in one. It's just a double-sided sheet. So here's an example of a fact sheet from the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, you see they have quite a few bulleted lists. Now, uh, your fact sheet may, may be a, a single column of bulleted items, and it may have eight to ten things. Um, it usually has a little logo up at the top and a title. Um, I know we haven't talked about design work, so you guys don't have to get really fancy with your fact sheets, but if you're whatever company organization you're writing about, you know, at least try to put the logo up there in the title and then bullet some, some information about your company or organization. So um, they're still written in AP style as well. Okay, so, um, you know, there's we've talked about all these different um, press release tools, company publications. Uh, we will delve into pamphlets and brochures later in the semester. We're going to talk about social media and websites as well. Um, of course, there's newsletters, magazines, and reports, all of these things. Um, you know, you can pull information from your backgrounder and fact sheet. Um, backgrounders and fact sheets are great to have on hand because, you know, I may not use the whole thing, but there may be some facts in that are important. For example, the nonprofit I work for, our fact sheet lists in there, you know, how many grants we've given away, how much money we've raised to date. Um, you know, we honor the top 10% of the graduating senior class every year. So how many students we've honored, how many distinguished teachers we've honored. So if I'm writing a press release about um, our, what we call our distinguished scholars banquet, our top 10% banquet, I'm going to pull that fact out of that fact sheet to include in my press release. Um, but I can also send that fact sheet in that backgrounder to talk about, you know, our organization is 14 years old. We started the banquet in, you know, 2000 and uh, whatever, I'm thinking 2003, you know, whatever year it was. And so, um, you know, it gives some background on that actual event. That way you, the press release can focus on the current event, the one that's going on this year, but the reporter has some history on it. Okay. 
oral presentations, and this will help you as you get ready to do your media briefing projects, okay? Remember, you guys have a big report after the fourth one, okay? So, um, slides outline the main focus. Uh, you'll see sometimes I'll kind of look up and I'll read the first part of a slide, but I try to actually ad-lib, and I won't, I shouldn't say ad-lib. I read from my notes, or I take other examples to give you as I go through, because you, you guys aren't eight. You don't need me to read word for word from the PowerPoint presentation, Okay. Obviously, PowerPoint's kind of the thing to use uh, with presentations. There's some others like Prezi and some things like that you can use. Um, using uh, short sentences uh, to summarize your point, you don't want a whole bunch of lines on a PowerPoint slide because they're really hard to read, okay? Just highlight the key points and then elaborate on them. Um, and, of course, we'll talk about speeches as well when we come uh, to speeches. They come in a lot of different forms. Um, I write speeches for, um, you know, we have a convocation at the beginning of the year uh, where we get up and talk. We have an end-of-year awards, and so I often write speeches for our superintendent and my board, present, uh, board president. And, you know, some of them are funny. Some of them are serious. Some of them have key points to get across, and some of them are just, hey, we're here. We're glad to kick off the celebration. Let's go. You know, so those really vary from, from uh, event to event. Okay. Remember, no matter what you do when you write a press release, a news story, a feature story, good lead, three sources, quote by the third paragraph, inverted pyramid, and you have to follow AP style guidelines. There, like I said, there's not a huge difference between writing a news story and writing a press release, with the exception of from the press release, you're telling your own story. From a news story, a lot of times you're telling someone else's. So from the press release, you get to put the positive things up front, uh, and you got to make sure your contact information is up in the top corner. <laughs> That's about the only difference. Okay, moving on. We'll talk more about persuasive writing next time as well um, as, we, as we begin to move forward uh, with other chapters in the book. But you are going to be writing a pitch letter. And um, we want to talk about what pitch letters look like. Like I said, there's some examples in your book on page 238 and 239. It gives you, um, there's a great chart on 239 that talks about what the purpose of the letter is and what the action is that you want to occur with it. So be sure to look that over. Um, when you're writing for, we look at persuasive writing, we talk about pitch letters. Because like I said, I work for a school district that's 45 minutes out of Dallas. So sometimes I have to send a letter in and pitch them this idea of a story that they should cover and why it's important that they cover it. In other words, who cares? <laughs> you know, why should the Dallas media cover this? So uh, my letter still has to be accurate, clear, and con concise. Um, you know, I have to uh, give a pitch that shows a particular point of view uh, that talks about why it's important for them to cover it because of their audience that they're broadcasting to. Um a brochure can be informational and persuasive. It can give facts and portray a positive image to the community. Um, a press release usually is just informational. Sometimes it can be persuasive and then it might have a call to action at the end. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think. I have a brochure right now in my office. We call it our menu of giving, and it talks about what our education foundation does and actually asks them to donate and gives them ways that they can donate. Um, you know, Pretty much anything you write, all those tools we talked about earlier in this lesson could fall under informational and persuasive, um, but you want to start with the information. Okay, so pitch letters. Um, it's really hard to do a pitch letter because a lot of times they, they you don't get a response, you don't know if they like it. Uh, so in order to improve your odds, let's focus on some important things for pitch letters. Um, it's just a letter, and it, it goes with a press release, um, media advisory, some full press kits. It's just a one-page simple letter. Um, basically, it's to get a journalist to take interest in your story. Um, why is it important to them? Okay, um, All of you probably had a basic business class where you learned to write a business letter. Okay, So basic formatting is fine. Uh, but when you're looking at writing those letters, and um, these five tips are there in your uh, – actually, there's ten tips total in your book – um, you know, you don't have to thank them all the time. You don't have to over apologize. Just act as if you're, you're really interested in what you're talking about and you're trying to convey your interest to this person and why it should be important to them. Um, you know, don't try to be funny. Um, it is a business professional letter. Um, I know we love humor in this class and we like to do lots of funny things, but a pitch letter is actually a very serious tone. Um, you know, use personal pronouns because, the readers have to understand that there are real people behind this. Oh, let me go back real quick. Uh, on the 
over complimentary obsequious notes, you know, that really uh, rings a bell with me because I'm often writing letters to pitch about uh, a fundraiser that we're doing or something for the kids. And so we don't want to say, oh, we'd be so grateful if you would cover this. Oh, please come out. Oh, thank you so much. It means so much to the kids. You know, certainly thank them, you know, apologize, move on, whatever you need to do, but you don't have to overly flower them. Okay. Let's not be a brown noser. In other words, let's just make it professional and, um, you know, try to get their interest peaked in the story. Um, so in personal constructions, avoid passive voice. Pretty much every time we have ever met, we have talked about active voice, active voice. So it's no different in these letters. Um, staying away from technical language, the education ease that we talked about that, you know, my industry falls, falls prey to the wordiness as well. Um, you can send a pitch email. They're a little less informal and they're easier to send. And in this day and age, that's certainly something easier to do, especially, um, you know, since there's a lot of media reporters. It's great when I'm contacting media stations to be able to email several reporters at once. And hopefully some of them picks up, pick up the story. But you still have to make it sound as if they're the only reporter you contacted, which can be a trick sometimes. Okay, so basically you guys know the, the regular format of a business letter. Here it is. There's also an example in your book. Here's the three things you need to look up with your pitch. You got to research your audience. Okay, you actually have to write the letter or make the phone call to pitch it. Yes, there are pitch phone calls out there. And you have to follow up. Um, you can't just throw it out there and then never follow up because we all get busy. We forget about things. Uh, just reporters do it all the time. And so you want to make sure that they're going to, you know, come out and cover what you need them to cover. Okay. So before you make your contact, again, this goes along with that media list. You know, make that media list for your pitch letters, for your press releases. You know, is it really worth it? You know, we have a local newspaper that the circulation is... I don't know, 6,000 people, maybe, on a Sunday. Um, and, you know, they do get out to our community. So, honestly, I don't really care about pitching for their printed edition, but I do pitch for their online edition all the time because they have, oh, something like 20,000 people follow them on Facebook. And if they will share the story on their Facebook page, then we get a lot more play out of that. So, knowing that, knowing where their deadlines are, um, they've gotten to where now they only print, I think their deadline is, uh, you know, Thursday afternoon for the Saturday edition. So, you know, you kind of have to get things in there earlier. Um, knowing, uh, you know, there's certain stories that will run, there's certain ones they won't. They really like at our local newspaper um, education stuff. And if we send them anything, they'll pretty much run it, which is great, but it has to be ready to go. Um, and pictures. Oh, we send pictures with everything. So um, the reputation of the writer or editor is very important. Uh, we had an education writer who covered our district for quite a while that I butted heads with for a while, and people did not like her in the community. Um, so we would much rather them run something from us with our tagline that it was a, you know, a courtesy story than have her write it because a lot of people wouldn't read her stuff. Um, and anything that you can come up with to customize your pitch uh, to make it pertinent to um, not only your audience, but the audience of that media outlet um, really helps because, you know, they have to sell advertising and get people to turn in or buy or tune in or buy their newspapers as well. So looking at your pitch letter, um, the best way is to look at some online. So go to Blackboard. There's a couple of pitch letters there. Uh, Google pitch letters. There's a ton of them out there. Uh, follow the 60 second rule. If you were in an elevator and you had 60 seconds to tell your story or pitch this idea to someone and get them excited, what would you do? So the 60 second or the elevator rule is a great way to start with your pitch letter. Um, you need one page with a good lead, straight to the point. Um, find out who the reporter's audience is because you guys may not share the same audience. And if you don't share the same audience, then are you really pitching to the right media outlet? Keep that in mind. Um, and then follow up, okay? All right, here's your elements of a pitch letter. You have to have facts. You have to have a good angle. You have to suggest some alternative angles because sometimes the interesting angle you want to use is not the one the reporter's going to pick up on. Um, if you make the offer to help them with research, with interview arrangements, with graphics, oftentimes when I pitch a letter, we're like, hey, we have teachers who are willing to, you know, we can schedule interviews with. We have students. Um, we have infographics. We have pictures that you can use. We have video footage. Do you need some B-roll footage? We can provide that for you. That helps because it's less work that they have to do, which is great. Um, anyways, also, if there's someone who's not affiliated with your organization, though, that is willing to talk on your behalf, that lends authority or credibility, that's fantastic. Um, and be sure to let them know, hey, 
you know, this is a timely, you know, timely news story. I'll be following up with you uh, next week to see if you want to come out and cover this, if I can set up some interviews for you. So um, think of it like those, uh, you know, resume interest letters that you pitch. You know, when you send over your resume and your interest letter, uh, your your cover letter with it, you say, hey, you know, thank you. I look forward to the chance to interview with you, and, you know, I'll be following up with you next week to see about that. It's the same thing. You have to follow up with a pitch letter. A couple more tips to, to talk about on there. Um, we already talked about deadlines, um, but don't call to ask if they got it. They, they got it, all right? They got it, and don't lie. Um, email pitches, similar to um, pitch letters, but they're brief. Don't put a lot of attachments. If you're going to send out to a lot of people, hide the other recipients, okay, and allow them to opt out at the end um, because, you know, maybe they, they just decide that they don't want to get your pitches anymore, so you need to give them that opportunity. Um, again, we talked about the follow-up. If, uh, if they say no, say thank you for your time. You know, I hope maybe I can send you some other ideas in the future, even though this one's not quite right for you. You know, don't burn that bridge, okay? You are in it for the long term, so you want to build a reputation with your media contacts and these reporters, okay? Build a good reputation. All right, so we talked about media lists earlier in the video, um, including the name of the reporter, any other useful information, deadlines that you can. All right, you're going to be doing that. Um, and we'll dive a little bit more into public relations and advertising, um, uh, where public relations and advertising meet. That's really what we call integrated marketing. They're, they're combining the two. Um, their PR marketing advertising are all, you know, cousins in the same family. Think of it that way. They're all different, but they're related. Um, most students have to take a few courses in each one, no matter what they major in. Um, a lot of you guys who are in business and film and communications are taking courses probably in some of these areas uh, as well. So it's really the combination. So, you know, public relations really focuses on the image or the reputation of the company. Um, when we look at advertising, that is more selling of a product and marketing. Um, like I said, I work in a department with uh, two other people, and my supervisor is uh, came to school public relations about three years ago. Um, and right, I, I had worked in Corsicana and Midlothian, and then I came back to Corsicana. So I've been doing it for, you know, nine, ten years now, but I came back to the same district with her about the same time she did. Um, and so I've been in public relations for a lot longer, but I haven't been in marketing. And so when it comes to actually um, targeting audiences with a specific message, she's a guru at that too because she knows how to take, for instance, a new graduation program or we're marketing our gala to people um, and really help with that. Um, I come in with a little bit different approach on, on the research side of, you know, how people are going to respond and react and how they're looking at us as our image overall. So she and I really actually complement each other well. We are in the communications department, but I have more of a PR background and she has a more of a marketing background. And that has what, what has made our department very successful in the last three years. So we went from three years ago, really not having much, having a really crappy website and no social media, very limited communications home, kind of a district with a little bit of a eh, uh, okay, bad reputation with parents in the community to something now that we've gotten all this good news out about our community. Um, you know, we have a website, we have a smartphone app, we have social media, we are regularly have newspapers uh, and, and or things in the newspaper. So, um, you know, those really complement each other well. Okay, so be sure to email or call me with any questions that you guys have because you're going to be working on your next three exercises. And you can ask questions on the 18th, um, but keep in mind you're going to be taking your midterm then as well. And um, they will be due on March the 25th, okay? So for the next three exercises, 11, 12, and 13, you pick a company or organization that interests you, okay? You can use the company you work for, um, our Papa John's guy, GameStop, <laughs> whoever, whoever you work for now, or if you're part of a fraternity or sorority. Um, if you struggle to come up with a company or organization, pretend you work for Baylor, okay, and write a news release about Baylor. Um, uh, you know, Connor, if you want to write about the equestrian team, you know, you can, and, and being a part of that organization or group. So, you know, just think about, pick something that interests you, all right, something that you're familiar with, that you have some knowledge about, and that way it'll be easier for you to write these next three exercises. So, so the first one is exercise 11, your pitch letter media list. 
all of these, there is a handout on Blackboard under assignments with, with these guidelines that you can pull up and print out, okay? So you're going to write a one-page pitch letter as if you were sending it to a reporter. You want to cover the story, okay? Um, it should be persuasive. You know, why should they cover it? Um, then you're going to attach a media list. You need to pick three media outlets that you would target your message to. For example, if you're writing as if you're in the Baylor PR office, you might not just send it locally. You might send it nationally. So say you want to send it to Newsweek, okay, um, or you want to send it somewhere else, um, go to the Newsweek's website and get as much information you can. There should be some information about a reporter, their email, maybe they have an education reporter, their email, um, and maybe their editorial calendar or something. Um, if it's a local organization, then maybe you just want to do it locally. Maybe you want to send it to the Waco Trib and to one of the, you know, was it Channel 25 or Channel 10, you know, one of the local news stations and maybe to the Baylor Lariat. So find three media outlets and, you know, put on there who you, what the outlet's name is, who you're going to contact. They have a phone number, email, um, fax. Do they have a deadline you can include? Um, so you need to put that on there. Um, the, you'll only turn in one copy of the letter. So you'll just address it to one of the media outlets and you're going to staple your pitch letter to your media list that has three contacts on it. Okay. So exercise 12 is an actual news release, a press release. So you, um, you've just pitched this story about your company or organization. Okay. Now you're going to write the press release about it. So something exciting going on with your company or organization. You're going to have to interview people. Um, you can review stories in local newspapers and online. So say you're writing the story about Baylor. You can pull facts and quotes for your press release, but essentially you're the PR person. So um, I don't actually want you to attribute facts and quotes to, you know, the Baylor Lariat or the Waco trip because it's your press release. So it's in your own words. You can't copy sentences and passages, but if you're writing a story from the Baylor PR office and you need a quote from the president and it, it was used in, you know, one of the Baylor Lariat stories, you can certainly use that quote because that's a quote from him that's public information. So... You're writing that press release. We're going to pretend that you got that quote. Um, if you're writing about your organization, the company you work for, you know, please get quotes from, you know, the people you work with. You do need to name them. It can't just be an employee of this company. It ha They have to be named and on the record. Okay. Um, do not cite other paper papers and articles. Okay. You're an internal employee, a PR person who got this information. So, your press release should be no longer than one to two pages, typed double spaced, okay? Use inverted pyramid, three sources, correct AP style, the whole nine yards. There are some samples on Blackboard again. All right. Now, same company, same idea. So you've got your pitch letter and your media list. You've got your press release, okay? Now, your backgrounder and fact sheet will accompany your press release. Page one is your backgrounder. Use the same company or organization. You're going to give some history, some important information about the company or organization. Um, if you were writing a press release about a very specific product or event, then maybe the background is just about that product or event. Okay, that's okay too. Um, and then the second one is going to have some bulleted accomplishments, goals, milestones, things about uh, your company, just factual information. So uh, again, there are examples on Blackboard that should help explain that. So um, I hope you guys have a great spring break. Please email call with any questions. Uh, I am not on spring break this week. Uh, I will be on spring break when I see you on the 18th. Um, just remember for your midterm, you need to bring your AP style book, um, something to write with, okay? Uh, I have the answer sheet and everything for you. You're probably going to want to bring some scratch paper because it is 40 multiple choice questions and two leads. You're going to be writing leads, okay? I'm going to give you the information that you have to take and write a lead about, all right? So I hope you guys have a great spring break um, and I will see you uh, in a couple weeks.